Well, I want to welcome you to our conference on the end time scenario. We are going to be pursuing the Word of God. And one of the things we always want to do under those uh, circumstances is to go with the benefit of the Holy Spirit. So let's solicit His attendance tonight. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for providing this opportunity to explore your word. We seek, Father, your Holy Spirit to guide us, give us discernment, that uh, we might be effective for you, that we each might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Savior. We ask this, Father, that we might be more pleasing in your sight as we commit this weekend and ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our coming King, the Lord Jesus Christ, indeed. Amen. So we are in the first session, and uh, uh, before we get into that, I might explain, people get a little confused of who are we. And uh, there is an, a 10-year-old trust in New Zealand called the Koinia International Trust. It's a charitable organization. And under it, there are two ministries, Koinia Institute in the United States. Koinia Institute is in 73 countries now. Uh, Koinia House is a publisher that's uh, headquartered in Idaho. So those are probably familiar to all of you, both of these things are. And uh, we form when we came down here, we formed a corporation called Lionshead Development Corporation to be the instrument by which we acquired the River Lodge. And so we purchased the lodge. And uh, we've also, it also has another, it has two wholly owned subsidiaries, River Lodge being one of them. And the other one is Lionshead Media. And there is a building just across here that houses the, the substantial technical assets for high-definition television and will shortly have uh, 100 megabit per second bandwidth and hope to do video conferencing worldwide from here. So that's part of what Lionshead Media is all about. All of these are aspects of a corporation that's owned by the ministry is the point. In the future, and now of course Lionshead Media provides publications to the distributor, going to your house obviously, uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere. But we also plan is just in the thinking stages so far, a leadership training center as part of our activity here. And uh, that would, uh, as we get earned gold medallions in the Institute, we would try to multiply that through a, a leadership training program here. But that's just in the future, but those are our thoughts. But um, we have an introductory session here this evening in which isn't part of the content, if you will, of the intended session. It's really a level the playing field kind of session. And I want to talk a little bit about eschatological hermeneutics. Esch eschatology is simply the study of last things. And hermeneutics is your theory of interpretation. And one of the places that will challenge your precision and, and, and the logic is in the eschatological hermeneutic area. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. And then we'll talk, I'll give you a preview of the sessions that we'll have here. And uh, one of the things is a foundational piece of a material called Daniel 70 Weeks. We'll be talking a lot about that, but I want to cover just the front end of that uh, in this first session here. And there was a confidential briefing that Jesus gave his insider disciples, four of them, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and, uh, and he points them in that briefing to Daniel chapter 9. And you'll see why that's going to be so foundational in your understanding of the scripture as we go. We'll talk about its scope and role of those last four verses of Daniel 9. And we're going to focus this evening just on the 69 weeks. So this is not end time stuff. This is past tense, but it's so profound that I felt it's, a, it's an important place to springboard from. And so we'll be for most of you, that may be a review, and if so, that's fine. But uh, I want to emphasize something about eschatological hermeneutics. We're not here to sell any particular viewpoint. Our goal is to equip you to be what we call a self-feeder, so that you'll have the background and perception to come to your own conclusions. So we're not here. We're going to enter into a lot of controversial areas. And I usually point out we, we don't play favorites. We'll have something here to offend everyone somehow. So we'll be uh, unabashedly going into some pretty turbulent waters here. And uh, so we're looking for uh, people, that uh, students who can think critically for themselves, and to have sufficient knowledge to navigate on your own. That's really our goal here in the Institute. And so your secret to avoid heresy is to rely on what they call the whole counsel of God. You avoid one verse theology. What you, what you need to do, whatever view you have, needs to fit into the fabric of the total picture. 
And that's your challenge. That's what makes it so challenging. And that's why so many pastors are reluctant to get into eschatology, because it really taxes their grasp of the, the Scripture as a totality. And uh, so you avoid, you avoid one verse to theology. One of the trademarks that we've used for more than 40 years is Acts 17.11. And it speaks of the people that were in the Berea. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the Scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. Now, uh, this, is, this has been our trademark, as I think, for over 40 years. And the Thessalonians were persuaded by argument, but, and the Bereans believed, but they, and they spiritually apprehended, but they searched like they were stalking game. That's what the Greek term actually implies there. And uh, so, the, uh, the first step is really the tougher of the two. For many of those years, I always thought the real point of this, this, this uh, verse was to search the Scriptures daily. And I, in recent years, have realized what's even a bigger challenge is to approach the Word with openness of mind. We all tend to bring to it our own presuppositions. Be on your guard there. So there's two, you receive the Word with all openness of mind, and yet you search the Scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. The way I usually summarize this verse, this is where Luke tells you, don't believe anything Chuck Mister tells you. I'll, I'll say what I can to guide you, but the point is, don't rely on me, rely on the Word. And that's, that's I want to underscore that as we go here. And so, so uh, that's Acts 17, 11. But the other aspect that undergirds our approach to the Scripture is what we call 6640. That's the name of our radio broadcast. It's been in this country for, I think, 13 or 14 years. And uh, so we speak of the 66 books of the Bible, and even though they were penned by over 40 different guys who didn't even know each other for the most part, and this all occurred over a period of 2,000 years, the staggering, there's two discoveries that changed my life at a very early stage. The first was the discovery that these 66 books, even though they're penned by 40 different guys at over uh, almost 2,000 years, it's an integrated message. I get so tired of some of these announcers on television say, you can't prove the Bible, but they go to say something positive. You can prove the Bible if you know how. And the first step is to understand the integrity of the package, because it's staggering. And you, in your own studies, I want you to confirm that every word, every number, every letter is there del by deliberate design. That's meaningless until you discover it for yourself. And once you do, it changes your entire attitude about the Word of God. And so, uh, the first step in what we call our epistemology is simply the study of knowledge, its scope, and limits. So our epistemological approach here, first, establish the integrity of the design. You can do that. As you study the Bible, you'll discover that every detail in Genesis is there for a deliberate reason that isn't realized until the, the New Testament and so forth. Those are things you need to discover. And so, that's, we have in our possession, what's sitting in your lap if you brought your Bible, is an integrated message system. 66 separate books penned by 40 different guys over thousands of years, in which every detail in there is by deliberate design. Once you discover that, you're confronted with a second discovery that derives from that, and that is, the origin of this message system that's in your lap had to initiate from outside the dimensionality of time, because it writes with incredible precision history before it happens, in a way that is supernatural. And uh, if God has the technology to create us in the first place, He certainly has the technology to get a message to us. The challenge is, how does He authenticate the message? How does He let us know that it's really from Him, and not some kind of contrivance or a fraud? And He does that by demonstrating an attribute that He alone has. He alone is outside time, and sees the end from the beginning, and takes advantage of that. And so, we establish the integrity of design. As you go through that design, you discover that every page points to a person, called the Messiah. The word Christ is a title, not a, not a second name. Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. The, the, and uh, so you establish the identity of this person. And he's on every page of the Bible, literally. Once you discover who he is, then he closes the loop. Well, I'll show you that. How do you know he's there? Because the scriptures were translated into Greek three centuries before his ministry. So I'm going to lean on the Old Testament Greek here, if you will. 
those Old Testament passages have over 300 specific specifications that were fulfilled during his ministry. And as you go through those, they're profoundly uh, that he'd be of David's family. He'd be born of a virgin. He'd be born in Bethlehem. He would sojourn in Egypt. He would live in Galilee, in Nazareth, in fact. He'd be announced by an Elijah-like herald that would occasion the massacre of Bethlehem's children. He would proclaim a jubilee in the world. Each one of these are taken out of the Old Testament. And uh, his mission would include the Gentiles. That's not, that's, that was in Isaiah, all, all through Isaiah. His ministry would be one of healing. He would teach through parables. He'd be disbelieved and rejected by his rulers. That was all predicted uh, all through the Old Testament. In fact, just focusing on the last week of his ministry alone, he'd make a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, he'd be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver, smitten like a shepherd, would be given vinegar and gall. They'd cast lots for his garments. His side would be pierced. Not a bone would be broken. And that's a specification all through the Torah and elsewhere. Would die among malefactors. His dying words were foretold. He'd be buried by a rich man. He would rise from the dead on the third day. And by the way, I found seven places in the Old Testament that that is alluded to, incidentally. And uh, his resurrection would be followed by the destruction of Jerusalem. So on it goes, on and on. And uh, so these are, uh, so the point is, you establish the integrity of the design, which establishes the identity of Jesus Christ. And once you know his identity, he then, of course, authenticates the rest. And that's not, that's not, um, because there's 66 six by 40 dollars, that's not self-reinforced. That, that's, a, that's a legitimate closing of the loop, if you will. And so... Okay, so we talked about 6640, that's why it's the name of our, we tend to overuse that work over the years, so it's become our, our rubric on the radio broadcast, as you probably know. But the other thing I want to put in front of us is the need for precision. There are many people that have a very loose uh, approximation of the Bible, rather than being recognizing its precision. And uh, so I want to deal with that a little bit. In Matthew 22, there's a very, one of my favorite events occurred. The Pharisees were gathered together, and Jesus asked them, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? See, the, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians had been hammering him with, uh, with uh, questions. So he finally says, Let me ask you a question. Oh, okay. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they, of course, knew their Old Testament. They said he's the son of David. That's no problem there. And Jesus said unto him, how then doth David, in spirit, call him Lord, saying, and then he quotes the first verse of Psalm 110. Jesus quotes, and says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now the question is, Jesus says to them, If David call him Lord, how is he his son? Now when, you, when you're arguing with attorneys, you better have your homework done. And he's taking on these attorneys. You call him the son of David, and how can David call him Lord if he's a son? They couldn't answer him. They're totally befuddled. I love this. I love the next verse. And uh, see, the son of David is clear in 2 Samuel. There's all through the Old Testament. That's clearly an identity. And uh, Proverbs 30, verse 4, uh, Who hath ascended to heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And here's the interesting. And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? See, that, that's what they're really drawing on here, in effect. Well, moving on here, I love the last verse of the, the, Matthew 22. It closes with this verse. No man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. So he sent them with their tail between their legs, as we might say, right? What you and I miss, unless we've done our homework, why were they so confused? And I want you to notice what his entire argument hangs on. Jesus is quoting the first verse of Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit down at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. On the slide here, I've put it in Hebrew for you. Okay? Now, something else you need to understand. All languages flow towards Jerusalem. All language, all nations that are east of Jerusalem go from right to left. Not only Hebrew, but Aramaic, and Sanskrit, and you name it. All nations that are west of Jerusalem go left to right. English, Latin, Cyrillic, Greek, all left to right. So recognize when I show you Hebrew, you're going, the normal direction is from right to left. You follow me there? 
You with me? Okay. Now, the word, you may recognize this one, yod vav hey that's the, what was typically translated Jehovah, if you will, the unpronounceable name of God. But what they used, what they, right next to that is the word Adonai, okay? And Adonai is the Lord. But this rendering of Adonai includes something very strange. If you look at the left end of that, it's followed by a yot. See that little thing? That, that's a, one of the 22 Hebrew letters that you and I would mistake for an apostrophe or a blemish on the paper. The yod. Putting the yod there on Adonai makes it possessive. David called him my Lord. And that's what they couldn't deal with because they didn't understand that he was the Son of God. You follow me? But the point I'm really I'm getting into this, I want to highlight something here. Jesus gives us a principle and even enunciates it for us in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. I'll come to it in a minute. Is that his entire engagement with those attorneys hung on his use of a yod in the Hebrew. So, and you think, well, Chuck, you're making something out of nothing. No, in Matthew 5, verse 17, 18, Jesus himself said, Think not that I come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. A yacht or a tittle, those are Hebraism. The yacht is that little mark I just showed you. The tittle are little hooks that distinguish some of the letters. That's a Hebraism. If I was saying this in English, I would say, not the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T shall pass until all be fulfilled. But understand what Jesus is teaching us here. He's calling us to take the text seriously, not approximate. I remember once that uh, when some of these paraphrases came out, I remember Walter Martin leaning over the podium and says, you would paraphrase God? <laughs> it was, he had an intimidating way of doing that. It was fun. But the point is, um, we need to understand that. Now, you and I live in the most blessed generation ever. The Word of God is more available to us than it's ever been in the history of mankind. You can go to the Hebrew or the Greek without knowing Hebrew or Greek. You put your little cursor on any word and a menu will pop up and tell you what the word is, the parts of speech, leave and diagram the sentence if you want to. And that software to do that is free of charge. There are dozens of packages, many of them available for the asking. And uh, so we live with the information appliance. Many of us carry five or six Bibles in our phone. See, the Word of God is accessible to us directly. You don't have to be stumbling over the King James or this or that or that because you can go with any one of those. They'll point you into what the original text said. And uh, there are a few places that there's still some ambiguities, but they're trivial. The truth of the matter is you can get at the Word of God like nobody in the past. You can do in 20 minutes sitting at a computer what used to take a pastor six or eight weeks of study because you can just pop right through and, 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 and uh, it's astonishing to realize that it helps out of there. So the need for precision, and I talked about Matthew 22. I am also have come to the conclusion personally that there are no synonyms. There are two words that may be synonymous in that they mean almost the same thing. But watch out for that almost because in the discrepancy between the two often lies a discovery. And one of the tricks I want you to remember is when you find a verse that's confusing or that seems to be self-contradictory in some way, make a log, write it down, and try to capture why it is that it confuses you. And you have an opportunity to do a lab course in the supernatural. Because what you do, having written that down in ink in your little private journal, make it private because it's intimate. No one is ever going to see it but you. So you'll be candid with yourself. You take it before the throne of the universe. Father, you told us you'd teach us all things, and I'm confused about this particular verse. I'm asking you in Jesus' name to reveal it to me. In His name I pray, amen. It's words to that effect. It may not happen in the next 10 seconds, but I'll tell you what will happen. You're going to stumble into a situation that's going to make that verse seem so clear you, for, you will have forgotten how confusing it was. It may be something you read elsewhere. It may be something you read in the paper. It might be a, a conversation you overhear in a restaurant. I don't know what the Lord... The Lord will do something to open that for you. What I want you to do is go back to that journal and mark that down. And say, why all the paperwork, Chuck? Because the day will come when you'll be traveling through the valley of doubt. 
And I want you to be able to go back to that journal, a private journal, and see the footprints of the Holy Spirit as He carried you through your growth in your knowledge of the Word. Every time you find a contradiction, every time there's a verse, you, and you've got a verse that makes no sense, I'll give you another secret. Put Jesus right in the middle of it and see what happens. You'll discover not only is it, does it hold the truth, it has a truth that has eluded other forms. So then, and the other thing you want to be careful, avoid error. It's amazing to me as you study uh, how we're all guilty of logical fallacies. It's important to build some tools for critical thinking. That's the whole thing. Well, this trust, of course, the International Trust has Koinonia House, the publisher, chaos.org, and Coin Institute is a think tank, volunteer, worldwide, that we want you to feel comfortable joining. But I want you to be aware of how it's organized because it impacts our way, our way we think here. And it has three avenues of study. The first one we call the Berean Avenue, motivated by Acts 17.11. That's the study of the Word of God. It takes priority over everything else, make no mistake. You with me so far? The second avenue we call the Issachar Avenue, after the sons of Issachar who understood the times. And that's where he put the study of prophecy, the study of stewardship, and the, what's going on today in our world. We've discovered that the tools and resources of those two avenues are opposite to each other. In the Berean, you know it's true, the challenge is to understand it. In Issachar, what you're dealing with is intelligence reports, news clips, you know it's biased, sometimes deliberately. Your challenge is to understand, uh, like Paul said, what is truth? You need to find out what's true. It's not trivial. And then, of course, all of that is for what we call the tactical perspectives. What do you, you have to answer the so what question. So what do I do about it? I've got all these neat verses about end times, that's great, and I've got these intelligence reports, what's going on in the Middle East or whatever, great. The question is, what do you do about that? That's the so what question. That's the koinonos, the doing. And uh, we believe that, the co the, that what we're being trained to do is to be ambassadors for the coming king. And we believe that the koinos tract of activity is motivated by the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless to take of his name in vain. We argue that's got nothing to do with vocabulary, swearing as it's usually taught. No, no, no. That has to do with ambassadorship. If you're going to take the name of the king, you better be prepared to represent him faithfully and competently. And that's what this whole institute's all about, hopefully, to train ambassadors for the Christ. Now, we also encourage our members to balance all three avenues together. Don't just be a Bible verse junkie, but try to balance it with the other, with a, with a understanding where we are in, in the world. And the second, and the finally, uh, answering the so what question. So what do I do about it? Putting shoe leather to your faith. Now, so we want them to balance all three, and we have awards for levels. If you get to the first level of all three, you get a bronze. If you get to the second level of all three, you get a silver medallion, and then uh, finally a gold, and so forth. Now, our, our goal is not a gold medallion. Our goal is a golden crown on a glassy sea. That's a whole different thing altogether. These are just trail markers to make it fun. So that's what we're all about. Now, we are in a conference this weekend we're calling the End Time Scenario. <coughs> Excuse me. There's another kind of conference that's strategic trends. They are different. They're not the same thing. I'll try to show you the difference here. When you take the result of both of those, you end up with tactical perspectives. We regard the end time scenario, what we're doing this weekend, as an exercise in the Berean Avenue of study. The focus here is on what does the Word of God say, the end time scenario. We we'll, will, to the periphery of what we're doing, talk a little bit about to the trends that are impacting, but that's not our purpose here. We'll be glad to respond to questions, and we'll use our free time that way if you like. But the, the strategic trends is an Issachar thing, and that's a whole other conference that focuses on, on that, you see. And it's when you've done both of those, you're then eligible for deciding what does that mean, that, that trying to find out what is your calling. How many of you are saved here? Can I see a show of hands? Praise God. How many know what your calling is? See, we got less than half. Some, some quickly and some, what do you mean by that, you see? Do you realize that uh, Peter was saved before he found his calling, before he had his calling? So we need to understand that those are different things. But uh, now, when we, uh, so we're, we're in a Berean weekend today. But there are times when we take those uh, all together and uh, we call that the, 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 the amalgamation, amalgamation of all those a strategic perspectives conference. We do that several times a year on a fairly large scale if we can, and so that's another thing. So what are we going to do this weekend? Well, we're going to have, we have this introductory thing tonight. 
Uh, tomorrow morning, we're going to hit head on what has to be the most preposterous doctrine in Christianity. This thing called the harpazo in the Greek, or a rapture in the Latin. And uh, the we're going to talk about the biblical basis for these ideas, and we'll talk about some events that we believe are pre-rapture. Events that we study a lot, that we happen to suspect, we don't know for sure, but we suspect, are actually before the rapture occurs. Then we have the 70th week, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, tonight in detail, about the 69 weeks of the 70. We'll talk a little bit about that. But the 70th week is a basic foundation. If you understand the last four verses of Daniel 9, the rest of the Bible will fall into place. If you're confused about that for some reason, you'll f discover you make a muddle of the rest of it. And that's where Jesus points. We'll talk, of course, about a thing called Armageddon and the Second Coming. How many have heard of that? I just want to see if you're listening. Okay, good. All right. And uh, the millennium and beyond. And then uh, we've got an event tomorrow night that's sort of an insert. It's an extracurricular thing. We're going to talk about transhumanism. And uh, it's something that's come. Yes, it is in the scripture, hinted at. But it's uh, coming on like gangbusters. And you'll be surprised with a little movie that we're going to show you uh, tomorrow night. And then Sunday morning, we'll de talk about post-rapture events from the Redeemer's point of view, from, from, from those that are redeemed, from their point of view. Um, we make all make our little charts with the abomination of desolation, make our little layouts of what happens on the earth. We're going to talk a little bit what happens after the rapture up there. And that's an area that's more important to you and me than anything we're going to talk about over the weekend. And we'll get at that uh, after that. Well, Jesus had a confidential briefing for four of his disciples. And they, they asked him about his return. And there were four guys there, Peter, James, and John, which you recognize as the inner sanctum. They're the only three that were at the transfiguration. They're the only three that were allowed in at Jairus' daughter's uh, raising and so forth. And uh, Peter's joined by his brother Andrew. So these four guys are treated to a confidential briefing on the second coming. We call it the, it happened to be in the Mount of Olives at night. It's in Matthew 24, but it's also in Mark 13. And so uh, uh, it's in two of the Gospels. Be on your guard. I'm guilty, of, like many, many scholars, of making a mistake for years, including Luke 21 as one of those, only to discover by looking at it more carefully that Luke 21 is not the Olivet Discourse. Some of the content is identical, but it's a different audience under different conditions making a different prediction. So you need to be on your guard that Luke, Luke 21 is a separate activity. And uh, don't fall into that trap. In our attempts to harmonize the Gospels, we got carried away, and most commentators failed to make that discernment. And I've attended meetings at the pre-trip study group and elsewhere to highlight that, and it's amazing how many people have just discovered that sort of thing. Matthew 24 and 25, and then Mark 13. They're virtually identical, with the exception of one verse difference, and we'll talk about that when we get to. But the 70 weeks, and... Uh, it consists of four verses. The most critical thing I want you to take away from this weekend are these four verses. If you really understand them, everything else will fall into place for you. The first of the four is the scope of the whole package. And that's verse 24. It's followed by a verse which deals with 69 of these weeks of years. And, um, and then there is an, uh, verse 26 is an interval. And verse 26 lies between 25 and 27. And I'm not being facetious here. Verse 27 is the 70th of the 70 weeks. The thing you've got to be alert to, because it's not obvious until you study it carefully, is that verse 26 covers some things that happen after the 69, but before the 70th start. That tells you that they're not contiguous. The 69 weeks are contiguous next to each other. There is a gap, an interval, and verse 26 talks about that. Once you realize that, the fog lifts, and it all becomes very, very clear. And uh, so we'll try to unsort some of that. Well, let's start with the scope of this whole thing. Verse 20, Daniel's in prayer, and he is um, uh, in captivity, but he knows the captivity's about over, so he goes to prayer about it. And while he's praying, Gabriel comes and interrupts his prayer. It's known as the interrupted prayer of the Old Testament. And he tells him a very staggering few verses. Verse 24 gives you the scope of what he's talking about. He says, 77, 70 Shabuim, are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Notice that that's not about the church, it's about Israel. Upon thy people and the city. What city? Jerusalem. Let's not lose focus here. To do six things. 
to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Wow. Ha have those six things happened yet? You could argue a few come close, but not really. Is there an end of sins? Pick up any newspaper. Examine our own lives. Whatever. No, this is incomplete yet. This is so comprehensive, it isn't wrapped yet. It's going to be wrapped up. Of the 70, 69 of those 77s are spelled out in verse 25. So we're going to take a look at verse 25. Gabriel says to Daniel, Know therefore and understand. See, this isn't cryptic. He is supposed to understand this. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two. Seven plus sixty-two is a total of sixty-nine. And notice this phrase that the Holy Spirit adds to the end of this. You see, there's actually four different decrees in history you could, get, you could stumble on, except three of the four have to do with the temple. The Holy Spirit says here at the end, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troubled times. He's not talking about the temple, he's talking about the city of Jerusalem. Only one of the four deals with that. It's in, New, it's in Nehemiah chapter 2. We know when that happened in history. And so, the point, this is a mathematical prophecy from the going forth of the, of the commandment, that's yet to happen, but when the commandment comes forth to rebuild Jerusalem, from that commandment unto the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah of the King, the word Nagid first appears of Saul as king. The, the Mashiach Nagid shall be 7 plus 62. This is, in my opinion, the most astonishing passage in the entire Bible. I'm going to try to show you why. The commandment to uh, restore Jerusalem is the trigger of this thing, and it, the, it, unto the Messiah the King. Now, if you take the, if you rec and it was, we are indebted to Sir Robert Anderson, uh, his classic work in 1894 called The Coming Prince. When I was a teenager, it was out of print, but a friend happened to have a copy and gave it to me, and it changed my life as a teen. It subsequently got back in print, uh, and under Kegel and others, it's, it, any good Christian bookstore will have a copy of it for you, called The Coming Prince. But the main point that he built, he, the insight, that, uh, Sir Robert Anderson was the head of Scotland Yard, by the way, incidentally, but he discovered by studying that God uses in Genesis 360 day years. In the book of Revelation, he uses 300, there's 360 day years. And so he recognized the implications of that. So if you take 69 weeks, 69 times 7, times 360, you come up with 173,880 days. Okay, that's terrific. What do you do with that? Well, the commandment destroyed uh, Jerusalem from Nehemiah 2, we discover, was the decree of Artaxerxes Law and Germanus, which was given on March 14th of 445 B.C. And all the background is in Sir Robert Anderson's books if you want to dig into this. Or you can get into our commentaries. We have all that in there. But the question is, okay, that's when that triggers this. When did Jesus allow himself to be presented as king? Several times in the Gospels, he, they try to take him, and he won't let him. An hour has not yet come, John 6 and elsewhere. Then one day he does something weird. He not only permits it, he sets it up. He has a donkey arranged by a password, and they go get it, and he rides that donkey, deliberately riding the donkey as required by Zechariah 9.9 into Jerusalem. We call it the triumphal entry. Okay? And so we know for a variety of reasons that that was April 6th of 32 AD. And what's interesting about that is when you look at these... Now, all of this, by the way, is in the Old Testament... So it was translated into Greek three centuries before the ministry of Christ. About two, uh, 285 B.C. under Ptolemy of Philadelphus in, in Alexandria, they funded the translation of the Jewish scriptures from Hebrew into Greek because most Jews didn't speak Hebrew, they spoke Greek. They, they used Hebrew like a Catholic uses Latin, maybe for ceremonial purposes, but they wanted their word, their, their scriptures, in their own language, which was Greek. So they had a translation done, and we have that product. It's called the Septuagint version. Fancy word for 70. 70 scholars were impaneled to do that. And uh, that's a matter of secular history. The Septuagint version was 300 years before the Christ's appearance. You with me so far? Okay. Now, if you go from 445 B.C. to 32 A.D., that's 173,740 days. March 14th, April 6th, another 24. And if you go through the rigors of the leap years, and that's complicated. That's another 116. I want you to notice the margin of error of Gabriel. It's zero. He spec the exact day. 
Now, what's going to shock you, though, is Jesus held him accountable for that. And we're moving this. In Luke 19, we have perhaps the most detailed account of the triumphal entry. And as Jesus came near, he beheld the city. What did he do? He wept over it, saying, If thou hast known even thou at least in this thy day the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. In other words, they were to recognize that day because Gabriel gave it to them. But because they didn't recognize it, he pronounces that from now on they're hidden from them. Wow. Forever? No. Paul will tell us no until, from Romans 11.25, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. But uh, this thy day is a very specific day, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. And so, not forever. And so, Romans 11.25. Now, we, the most exciting uh, element of the end time scenario is before our very eyes. Because that blindness is beginning to re be relieved in Israel. Ten years ago, if you were a Jewish believer and planning to move to Israel, you, had, you were warned by your friends, don't let anybody know. If you're Jewish, it's fine. If you're Gentile, it's fine. But if you're a Jewish believer, they're out for you. It was something you kept underground. Not anymore. There are 350 Messianic fellowships in Israel today. Small ones, but they're there, open. Boy, that's a change. That blindness is beginning to be relieved for a lot of interesting reasons. Well, Jesus continues here in Luke 19. He says, For the day shall come upon thee, Jesus speaking to them, For the day shall come upon thee, thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and they shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. This is a triumphal entry. Thirty-eight years after he said that, Pastor Vespasian had the 5th, 10th, 12th, and 15th Roman legions lay siege to the city of Jerusalem, in the 143 days, 600,000 Jews were killed, and more than that, uh, historians estimate that over a million and a half men, women, and children died because of the plagues and all the rest of it. The, the, that's the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. To this day, if you're in a Jewish wedding, they take the gablets they're using and crush them. To, uh, step, step on the, you, they break the glass. That's their gesture to commemorate the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. They do that still to this day. The question I want to ask you is, why was Jerusalem destroyed in 70 A.D.? If you had that on a test question, there's a lot of good answers you could give. But I want you to be conscious of what Jesus, how he would answer that. Because he said here, they will not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Jesus ascribes the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. to the fact that they didn't um, know the day he presented himself as king. And that's a st that to me is chilling. Jesus held him accountable for that. Thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. So, he held him accountable for that. Okay, so that's the 69 weeks I've included, because that's not prophecy, that's history. But it's so profound, it's a cornerstone of our understanding of the scripture. And uh, we're going to move on to verse 26, which is where we are today. It still isn't prophecy, in a sense, because we're in that one. We're all interested to move on what happens next. We will, of course, tomorrow morning. But uh, after the three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the princes shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And so, cut off, cut out, that's executed. The Messiah is going to be executed. It's in the Old Testament. It's here. In Psalm 22, it's detailed in such detail, there are articles in the American Medical Association Journal explaining the cause of death from the details that are in Psalm 22. Um, but he does this not for himself. See, cut means to cut off, kill, exterminate, execute. But not for himself. Who did he do it for? You and me. The people of the princes shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The city was destroyed in 70 A.D. and the sanctuary, so we know this interval is at least 38 years long. See, it started at the, at the 69 weeks, it terminated. The 70th hasn't started yet. It won't for at least 38 years. In fact, we now know it, it won't start for about 2,000. Okay? So, you see, we have the, within that interval, we have the cross. It's not part of the 69. It's after the 69. It's after the triumphal entry. And we have the uh, temple uh, destroyed. 
That happens in the 38 window. We, we know, though, the 70 week hasn't started yet. You with me so far? You see how foundational this is to understanding the scenario here. And uh, this interval is also implied all through the scripture, and those ver verses are in your notes. You can check it out in your leisure. And uh, this interval is implied 24 times in the Bible. And I find that fascinating because 24, the 24 elders are the redeemed in Revelation. The 24 speaks of the redeemed. And uh, it's actually, if you go through the whole scripture, you find 24 places that in this interval is, is uh, implied. And uh, so, and one of the things we discover is that the uh, scripture seems to use Israel and the church mutually exclusively. But that's the principle you have to... Uh, this interval is defined in Luke 19.42 and until 11.25, so that's where it's, it's pinned down for you, if you will. And uh, this interval is the period of the church. It's an era that was kept secret in the Old Testament. And that's Paul's opportunity in Ephesians. The epistle to the Ephesians celebrates that he was given the privilege of discovering something that was hidden in the Old Testament. And that's why he's so overwhelmed with this whole mystical church, the, the mystery of the church. And it was born at Pentecost, and it, it's the prerequisites to happening was the atonement, the resurrection, and the ascension had to occur before Acts chapter 2. And that's the birth of the church. And, it's, and once you understand the seven feasts of Moses, and you understand the feast of Shavuot, you see it was predicted in that feast, and maybe much more than most people realize. I think it also includes some other prophecies about the church. That's another subject we can talk about on Sunday. The church's mystery character, the concept of the body of Christ in Ephesians 3, is in the fact that it indwells every believer. That's a concept that Paul, taught by Gamaliel himself, blew his mind. That the Holy Spirit was given without repentance. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Wow! He understood what that meant. And, and, and sometimes you don't understand his answers because we don't understand the question he's responding to. And the, the issue of the bride of Christ, we'll talk more about that on Sunday morning. And we're going to deal with uh, the first thing tomorrow morning, the harpazo, the rapture. What is all that about? And the fact that there's one new man and so forth. And the, uh, and the fact that in the scripture, you find Jews and Gentiles separated. There is an interval in which they're neither Jew nor Gentile, you're a church. There's three categories, Jew, Gentile, and the church. What you discover is after the church, it goes back the other way. In Revelation, there are Jews and there are Gentiles. So th that's when you realize the church ain't there. It's only there in chapters 2 and 3. Why? What's that a lot about? We'll talk about that more. So the book of Revelation is key here because the only book of the Bible that has the audacity, the chutzpah, if I may, to say, read me, I'm special. No, the book of the Bible says, read me, I'm better than the rest. No, no. Only one. Revelation says, read me, I give you a special blessing. And he does. He does. And uh, it's all... Co one, I remember as a teenager, I heard a lecture once, and, it be, and the guy that, the expert that was there, we, we became good friends, and I used to drive him to his speaking commitments and got tutored that way. But uh, the whole idea of the book of Revelation is in code. And every code is explained somewhere else in the Bible. And if you study the book of Revelation properly, it'll take you to virtually every other book in the Bible to unravel. Those codes are used consistently. If you're in a, theolo a seminary, you say that's the principle of expositional constancy. That's just giving you a fancy label to the fact that the Holy Spirit uses idioms consistently. The rock or the stone that the builders rejected is the rock that followed in 1 Corinthians 10.4, and they're used consistently throughout the Scripture. That's when you realize the real author isn't the penman, it's the Holy Spirit. Now the most relevant parts of this book, the book of Revelation, the most important chapters are chapters 2 and 3. The rest of it is future. We'll watch it from the mezzanine. But chapters 2 and 3 affect us every day in ways that will astonish you. And we'll touch on that on Sunday. We'll touch on it along the way, but we'll bore into that Sunday morning. And so, they go to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Seven churches. Why those seven? Why did Jesus pick those seven to write to? Most of these you never heard of unless you, except in this chapter. Ephesus you heard about, of course, and a few of these you may have heard, but most of these, you wonder, why them? And the answer is, because they have at least four levels of interpretation. It turns out that when you understand each of those letters, each letter has a specific theme. And in that vein, these seven letters lay out in advance the history of the church. If they were in any other order, it wouldn't be true. 
And so Ephesus is the apostolic church, the first century church, followed by the persecuted church. Smyrna is the, is the synonym for myrrh, an embalming ointment for burial. And Pergamos is a, a, bigamy is married to two people, monogamy one person. Pergamos is a misguided marriage, a perverted marriage. And that's where the church marries the church. What Satan couldn't accomplish by persecuting, he accomplished by having the church marry the world. And that leads you into that era, which is very descriptive of the third century and so on. And then we get to the medieval church. And I'm being generous here. Some people say, well, that's the Vatican. No, it's much more than that, but that's the flavor of it. And then we have Sardis, the denominational church. Now, the Thyatira letter is shredded by Protestant commentators. They love Thyatira. It's the longest of the letters. And they really take into the Vatican because it really is clearly uh, fits. Well, if that's the case, if Thyatira represents the Vatican, then Sardis represents the Reformation. Sardis is one of two letters that has nothing good said about it. You have a name only, but you're dead, is the, the theme there. Whoa! Whoa! And I think most of us recognize those denominations that derive from the Reformation today have lost a certain vitality. And then, of course, we get to Philadelphia, and everybody, of course, is the Philadelphia Church. I mean, that's the good guys. They really, they really do well, so we're obviously Philadelphians. And Joe Folks, the pastor of Calvary Chapel, Philadelphia, is a good friend, and we have a lot of fun with that one. And, uh, but then we have, of course, Laodicea. And everybody that studies this, it's really clear when you get into these that we are clearly in the Laodicean church today. And in that model there, Jesus is outside knocking to get in. He's not even in the church. If any man open the door, and up, I will come and say, that little verse, verse 20, is used by so many evangelists. And it is a useful evangelistic verse, except if you look at where it is in context, it's really the final indictment. Because there isn't a promise to the church as a whole. If an individual there makes an exception, he'll, re he'll receive them. Heavy stuff. So we need to understand those churches. Now we notice something interesting about the first three that most commentators don't catch. Each one of these has a promise to the overcomer, but in the first three it's a postscript. It's added at the end of the letter, outside the body of the letter. And uh, in the last four, the promises are in the body of the letter, which is different. There's a structural difference. For some reason, the Holy Spirit separates these into two groups. Why? Well, we notice something else about the last four. Each of the last four has an explicit uh, reference to the second coming of Christ. Ooh. So the last four represent conditions that endure to the end. In fact, Thyatira has a promise that if they don't change, they're going to go into the Great Tribulation which itself answers a big doctrinal question. If they don't get their act together, they're going to go into... Well, what does that mean if they do get their act together? They won't go into the tribulation. You follow me? The logic is pretty straightforward. One of the last four is promised that they will not even see the time of the great tribulation. And uh, so, um, so now, the Sardis and Laodicea are problematic. What happens to them, we're not sure. I think the first three have a place in history, but the last four endure to the end. That seems to be, as you get into the letter, that seems to be the possibility. Well, getting back to um, the interval here, after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come, the prince that shall come is one of 33 titles of the Antichrist in the Old Testament. We'll be getting that into that tomorrow a bit, obviously, but that's one of 33 titles. And what has misguided so many people, he says, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, the, the prince that shall, the people of the prince that shall come, they were the Roman, they were Roman legions. And because of the Roman legions that destroyed the temple, everybody ran to their uh, drawing board and started writing books that obviously the, the uh, people of the prince that come shall come are the Romans, Roman legions. And it's on that thread that we have this concept of a European uh, group that come into Armageddon and so forth. It's not in the text. You won't find that in the summary of that in Daniel 11 elsewhere. That's a contrivance. I've been guilty of it too. I've been taught by the same guys for years, and many of my early materials made that same mistake. Because I didn't do my homework. And I'm indebted to Wally Shabbat for pointing away. Because it's all in Josephus. The people of the prince that shall come. What were the, what were the people that destroyed the... the, the uh, yes, they were the Roman legions, but the Roman legions weren't Roman. They were conscripts. 
If you go through the records, you discover it was the 10th legion that destroyed the temple. And the 10th legion considered the four cohorts that were Assyrians. Assyrians. The Romans conscripted young men in, in, into their, into their uh, legions. And so the fact that they were Roman legionnaires doesn't mean they were Western Europeans. They were Assyrians. And that happens to concur with Micah and Isaiah, and we'll talk about that tomorrow some more. Anyway, the Prince of Shell comes one of 33 titles, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow. The people uh, are, another, that's a whole other story. Well, then, of course, we get to the 70th week, and uh, the, uh, this is foundational to both the Old Testament and the New Testament eschatology. You will not understand either one unless you really develop a command of the last four verses of Daniel 9. So if you haven't done it yet, I encourage you to do it. And if you've done it already, I suggest you review your notes. And we're going to make that whole issue, the 70th week, the key topic on the third session. This is the first session. Tomorrow morning we'll have session two, and we'll talk about the rapture. Let's get that out of the way. It's the most preposterous doctrine of, of uh, Christianity. And I'm, remember, I'm reminded by Richard Feynman, who's probably the, one of the great guys in, in, in uh, in uh, quantum physics. And one of the things, he, one of my favorite quotes of R Richard Feynman is this, of all the theories of science, the most ridiculous is quantum theory. The only thing that it's got going for it, it, it happens to be unquestionably correct. And uh, of course he's got his tongue in his cheek there, because it's very true, quantum theory is really bizarre. Well I see a parallel with in terms of the rapture. The rapture has got to be one of the strangest concepts in evangelical Christianity. And it's very divisive. A lot of people have uh, problems with it. A lot of people really get carried away with it. We'll try to, tomorrow, get at the biblical basis of that view and try to deal with it then. And we'll probably discover some surprises. And so, uh, so we're going to deal with this uh, in our session tomorrow. And so, Father, we thank you for this weekend. We thank you for the time together. We thank you for the fellowship that we have in Jesus Christ. And Father, we do espouse Augustine's admonition that in the essentials, unity, but in the non-essentials, liberty, but in all things, agape. We do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would illuminate your word and guide us, that in all these things, we will be able to more clearly focus on your calling that we might, each of us, understand precisely what it is that you're calling us to. That we might be ever more responsive to your word, that we might be more pleasing in your sight, as we do indeed commit ourselves, without any reservations whatsoever, into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our coming King indeed, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.